Mr. John, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Good I don't afternoon. know if, if you can hear me clear. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you for, for the time. Uh, I've been listening to other speakers, and uh, it's really been an informative session. Uh, yes, uh, we are talking about scholarship. Yeah, I'm a recipient of the Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's Degree Scholarship, uh, which is which cut across various countries within Europe and uh, in other cases, at times, few schools outside of Europe. And, uh, it's majorly hosted across more than a, a single institution, meaning it's a joint degree. And so you you have the opportunity to earn more than one master's degree. Yes, it's a master's degree scholarship. And so you have the opportunity to earn a double or in some cases, triple master's degree as the number of institutions require. So some people go to two institutions, others three, and it could also be as much as four. So I'm studying, I had my first year in, uh, in the UK. I'm currently in my second year in Italy. And, uh, apologies if there are a bit of, uh, a bit of noise. I'm actually outside, so that's the reason. So uh, I've listened to the first speaker. I think the first speaker did a lot of justice to talking about scholarship and he covered a whole lot of areas that I might probably have thought to, might probably have thought to talk, talk about. So uh, interestingly, the, a lot of the points you mentioned, they talked about uh, code mailing and a lot of things that has to do with the format for North America. So just to bring a different approach, I would uh, talk a bit generic and also specific as to those that might be interested in, uh, in Europe in getting scholarship across Europe and uh, and something different a bit from North America. So uh, first of all, in uh, he talked about the research assistantship, which really isn't uh, uh, a form of uh, a public scholarship, uh, which is uh, something related to funding gotten by supervisor, and uh, you apply, and the supervisor is willing to take you in. But in the case of public scholarship, which is uh, one that I'm a recipient of. Uh, you have a you have a different strategy to it because you are faced with a limited number of slots and uh, uh, it's it's something public so everyone has access to it. So, for example, uh, for example, in the in a public scholarship like the Chevening, the Chevening, the Commonwealth, the Erasmus Mundus, you are. You are jostling with a lot of other applicants on uh, on a very limited opportunity, and so you want to put in your best foot forward during the application. And uh, something about that is uh, an important thing about scholarship, which is different from assistantship, is that uh, there are time durations and there are timelines to which each of them come out. So you also want to be well aware of that. And so you can always look up and be conversant. Something I always do is I have an Excel spreadsheet where I have the different scholarship when applying and uh, I know the deadline, the timelines and uh, what are the requirements, do I have all the requirements at a particular time, what are some of the details I need to prepare to have during my application. Then uh, secondly, you also want to consider that uh, what is my profile and uh, how well do I stand to be able to get this scholarship? Because uh, while the juiciness and the attractiveness of scholarship lies, you also understand that you are competing with people, several other well qualified candidates from across the world. And so I have a principle that scholarship isn't given to the person that needs it just because you need it or because you are less privileged. Uh, most scholarships are not charity organizations, they only give it to those that. They, they see the potential to be able to give something back in return. And so in life, at times, uh, some things are free, but when you look at it in well, you discover that they are not free. For example, if you are coming to Europe, and uh, the reason why they want to take it is because they believe that you can offer something and contribute something to 
their own environment also. And so the reason why they are giving you the funds is because they believe you can have something to contribute. So they would really give you something because they, you feel that uh, you don't have the capacity to pay for it. So uh, let me just go to a bit more details uh, from where I said last, and it is the fact that uh, your strength and your uh, and your your own uh, individual your application profile should stand strong. And I always say that it's a well-rounded profile that went to scholarship, not necessarily uh, the person that has the highest GP. So uh, some persons can, uh, you can have a post class and you're still applying for three, four years. You've not gotten it. Why grades are important, it is also beyond grades. It's a well-rounded profile that went uh, a scholarship. For example, assistantship that the first speaker, that the first speaker talked about. Uh, the first speaker mentioned that there's no professor that would uh, work uh, was two, three years and applying for grants and uh, we want to take you if he doesn't think that you have something suitable to contribute to his lab. So you have to put that at the back of your mind. So you want to consider what are my, what are my areas of skills and uh, what are the things that I can contribute in order to to win. So uh, a well-rounded profile goes beyond uh, just your grade. You want to see what are my research strengths, what are my skills, volunteering opportunities. You also want to you also want to look at you also want to look at the you also want to look at things like uh are there standardized tests that are required you want to look do i have the test that is required you are looking at your cv now about the cv i remember the first speaker was talking about the difference between the professional cv and the academic cv i want to say the the way you present what you have done really matters and so uh, you can see someone that has done a lot of things and uh, the way he puts it doesn't uh it doesn't show his strengths and his skills so much that someone wants to see that he has done he has done a lot of things we see that he has done a lot of things so it is important that you present what you have done in the best format to be able to win yourself a scholarship so when i meant a well-rounded profile you want to consider outside of grade do i have the suitable skills uh, the first speaker mentioned about publication while you might not have a sufficient publication from undergraduate level, how well you present some of your undergraduate thesis, for example, the project you did, how well can you talk about it and say this is what I did and uh, this is the results that I got from, from my thesis. Maybe you've done some summer projects, internship, and you have the thought about it. You can always uh, put it in, in your CV and talk about some of those things. And so the, generally your profile is what is much more important, not just, not just grade only. So you want to ensure that you tick the different boxes in a line. Now again, uh, I know that the area of strength is, is something that every applicant should know. And so I don't want to dwell much about that, but just know that aside your grade, you can try to also get things like uh, online certificates. You can take uh, open courses just to add some things. If you are deficient in one area on your CV, you always want to look at how well can I cater for other areas so that uh, my profile will not only be looked at through the lenses of my grade, we can also see something other than my grade that reflects my grade. And I said about presentation, for example, if you have a four points for, you might not want to write it as a second class offer, you might just want to put your grade that you, you finish, and if you know the ranking, you finish in class, maybe you finish in the top 3%, 4%, Maybe in your department, no one finished the first class, but you were the best graduate student. So you don't need to talk about that I didn't finish with the first class. Instead, you talk about the ice and uh, you take away the lows. You can say that I finished in the top 7%. And the use of numbers is something that always works well. Uh, you might be in an internship and you say that you rank among the top 3% during my, my penultimate year in university, which placed me uh, uh, on a scale to be able to win so 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 and so amount so how well you present what you have done really matters it might be maybe you worked on a project and maybe you presented the project in a it might just be maybe a regional or even your university you can say that in my university during my thesis i i presented my final year thesis and uh it was it emerged second it emerged first in uh in the in the in the university ranking something like that just something to spice up to spice up your profile and so when people see that everyone wants to see what are the things that an applicant has, has done? And it's generally said that someone that has won a scholarship has more potential to win another scholarship than someone that has not won before. The reason is that you believe that someone that has won before 
can contribute, has something to contribute. That's why I want something before. So I should be able to commit something into the person again. Just like it said in Christianity that to, that someone that has done something, you can commit more to the person. So it's not like someone that has a talent, you are willing to commit more to the person. So even if it's in your first year, you will really top in the faculty. All those salient points are things that you should highlight on, on your CV. So before I go to talk, just a bit about the scholarship that I won, just for those that might be interested. I also want to talk about uh, applying to the places that matches your profile. I know a lot of people are so interested and they want to apply to everything possible in the world. Well, why that is good and that, why that shows a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of, uh, a lot of zeal on your own part. But then it could also get you frustrated because I can tell you honestly, rejection can suck up your veins and demoralize you and demotivate you from wanting to apply for that. So one thing you should do is uh, you should channel your application to the best area of your strength. And that is what and that is what people that's what people do not do. They always want to just uh, they don't look carefully at what they are applying to and they just apply and so when you apply this year you get rejection, next year you get rejection. I'll tell, I'm telling you only those that are persistent enough can keep doing it. So what you should always that what you should always do is you should look at you should look at an application and look does this match uh, does this match my profile and does this gives me the best possible shots to win it. And so, for example, uh, we see someone asking about the achievement scholarship and uh, you don't have enough volunteering experience, you don't have leadership experience, you've not done anything, and uh, your profile does not reveal of someone that has covered something related to that scholarship. You will just be wasting your, your time at times. I don't want to say you're wasting your time, it doesn't look too negative, but in the real sense, if I would be very objective to you, you should look at uh, the overall objective of a program, a scholarship you're applying to, and see if it matches up to my own profile. Mm. And so what people do many a times is you just look at this and you apply. You don't even know what is the objective, what are they trying to, who are the applicants they are trying to target, and what are the type of awardees they are seeking to get. So if you don't have uh, a vast amount of leadership, you don't have anything in NGOs, you've not done some things. Now, what I'm saying is, it's not as though you have done a lot of things that determines what you get. That's why I talked first about presenting. For example, you could be the leader in your church and maybe you've managed 10 groups, that's a leadership position, and you fail to put it in your CV. That's something that could, maybe through the group you manage in church, you're able to lead them to, uh, maybe you went to an orphanage home, and you covered some places, you could list some of the things you've done. That, that is some things in leadership and volunteering that could help in your CV. So I'm not just saying you, could, you can't apply to some of those positions, but how well you present it makes your profile stand strong. Yes. So uh, always look at the objective of a scholarship. I mentioned about the achievement. They, they are looking at a volunteering leadership. You look at the Commonwealth, what are they looking at? Are they looking for bright students academically? Now, there are some scholarships that are academic-oriented, while some are just leadership and volunteering-oriented. So if you have a very high grade and you have less leadership and volunteering position, you want to skip some of those scholarships and look for what matches your profile well. So you need to look at that. For example, you will not be applying to get as much movies, and your focus is on how you have the poor and how you have that. Whereas it's a research-oriented focus scholarship. We had the program of program organizers, the same way you are applying, the same way they apply to the European Union to get funding for the program. And so they are not just looking for someone to help, they are looking for someone that will be able to contribute to their own research. So you are trying to see that I understand the objective of the program and uh, my profile matches up to it. And so when you are applying to such positions, you want to see uh, what are my research profile and what are the things that are on my CV that makes me the best candidate for the position. You look at your academic strengths, you look at uh, you look at some of the things you've done. Maybe I was mentioning about paper publications, summer projects, and things like that. Things that make your profile stand in line with uh, what you are applying towards. It could be also your work experience and things like that. So those are the things that strengthen your application. So always look to match uh, your profile with the objective of a program is very, very much important. And so even when you, when you are doing the right things and you are not getting in, then you know that you are just trying to trick. Maybe you have not been writing 
uh, maybe your statement of purpose will yeah, there's another thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, one of the most fundamental and important aspect of application is your, is your writing skill. Like I said, how you present. And so you might have the best profile, but uh, your writing skill is poor. So uh, it is what you write that stands before the, before the panel, before the awardees. It is not you. Even before the interview, they first look at your profile and they look uh, about they look at what you have presented before they can say, uh, "I'm willing to offer uh, this position to to this candidate." So look at your writing skill. How well do you present? You don't want to write disjointed and uh, and everyone is finding it difficult to understand what you are trying to pass across and what you are trying to present. And so uh, writing your statement of purpose is something that is very important. Your motivation letter. You want to track, you want to carefully go through uh, the objective and make sure that it is well tailored towards your application. I know a lot of people just want to jump overnight and uh, just want to jump overnight and just put up some things. You also understand that you are, you, are, you are sending it to professors and researchers that are seeing thousands of other applicants. And so if your, if your document, if your write-up is not well structured, uh, it's just next to throwing it to the trash. So that's very much important. Uh, so I can I can talk more more about some other things, but I believe the other speaker have talked about some other things like which you can use to build up your profile, like if a test, if uh, for example a proficiency test is required, it's, it's good you take it. I know people always want to skip it, but then you ask yourself, uh, there are several other people that are applying with me and. Uh, if you have two candidates that have same profile and uh, they are only going to take one, they are obviously going to take the person that has the more requirements. So always look to have more than enough requirements that is needed, rather than trying to cut corners. A lot of people always want to cut corners and say, "By studying in English, see that's not the problem. You study in English. Why should I take an English test? I don't always. You are they are committing a lot of funds into your hands." over 40,000 euros, for example, in Europe. So no one will give you because uh, you, are, you are trying to prove a point. Yes, there are, there are places where you can always put something instead, like a proficiency letter from your university that you studied in English. But where it is not explicitly stated and it is required, it's always good you have more than enough requirement to put, to put forward. I also know that uh, some of the other applicants you're even thinking about, they have more than the required documents to which you are trying to obtain sh yourself and applying for. For example, going to the US, that GRE, yes, someone else may be applying from Europe or somewhere that has a very high grade, can try to choose whether I'm doing it or not. But your profile is not so strong, so you need some of those other requirements to help push it up, push it up further. Yeah, so let me just stop here in case there are other questions, so I don't take a lot of time. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much, Mr. John. I have a specific uh, question I want to ask about uh, Erasmus Mundi's uh, scholarship. Now the question is, what's the uh, position of uh, English language proficiency examination in securing that scholarship? Is it a must for me to write TOEFL GRE to secure Erasmus Mundi's scholarship? That's my question. Okay. Uh... Okay, let me just use the opportunity to talk generally about the Erasmus Mundi Scholarship. Uh, it varies program by program. So what applies to one program might necessarily not apply to another program because there is a general consortium and uh, each, uh, each, each program uh, uh, open to uh, using their own modalities and their own rules for their own application. And so, uh, first of all, you can't apply to more than three Erasmus Mundus program. In a, in a calendar year. If you apply to more than three, you'll be disqualified even if you get to win one. That's the first thing. Then, uh, then secondly, uh, you, you have two, two routes which uh, you can apply as a program country or as a partner country. So I want to assume everyone generally here, if you've not studied for more than a year outside of Nigeria within Europe, if you've not studied within Europe, you're a partner country candidate. So program country candidates are only those that had their bachelor's degree within Europe or are European citizens within the last uh, five years. Then uh, the next thing is I said that each program uh, has the chance to make their own rules. 
And so when you go to, you can just type on Google the E, just type the Erasmus Mundus catalog, you see the direct link, it will bring you to the EACA uh, website, which has a list of all the programs, over 100 programs. So you can always uh, apply a filter, maybe to your discipline, engineering, and uh, it will bring you the list of programs within engineering, for example, that you are eligible to apply for. Now, each program has a website through which you can make your application. So on that website, uh, you to take you directly to the individual website of the program. This is where each program have a varying uh, application requirement and rule. Even though all of them are still under the European Commission, they have their own specific set of rules. And so some program might require a form of, might require the English test as, uh, as was asked, why some might just be okay with you uh, having a letter from your institution, or if you are from a particular country, say Nigeria, you might be exempted from taking the test. So it depends on the, on the requirements that each program has. For example, for my own program, uh, it was it was mandatory for us to have the to have the English test. And some programs are going to put uh, a breakdown of uh, the allotted marks for each application document you send. I remember during my own case, we had 70% allotted to academic grade, then we had about 10% uh, uh, allotted to English test, then we had another 10% to, uh, I think, the CV, then we had a 10% allotted to the reference letter and the statement of purpose. That is 30 plus 7 to making 100. There are other programs that could divide it in a different way, maybe 45% for grade. They put 15% for the ranking of the institution. Some can put 15% for English test, another 10%. So it varies according to the program. It's program by program. So I cannot answer specifically that this program. I know of some colleagues that did not take the English test because their program was not specific about it. But just imagine you're applying to my program that has 10% allotted to it. You're already shortchanging yourself. In fact, it's mandatory, so you can't even get it. So it's, it's good you, you go to each of the programs to know what is required by you. Thank you very much. Now, the good news is I'm aware that Erasmus Mundi scholarship for the year 2020 is already out. I saw the link um, yesterday. It will be posted on our Telegram uh, platform for anybody that is interested in exploring that. So thank you very much, Mr. John. Thank you for your time. Now, without wasting our time, I want to call the next uh, speaker. That is Mr. Thank you. Thank you. He is a PTDF scholar.